Good morning, my friend. I'm Dr. Lee Warren, and it is Self Brain Surgery Saturday. I'm so excited to be with you. We are wrapping up Mind Change March. It's Silent Saturday on the on the Christian calendar. We're getting ready for Easter. Yesterday was Good Friday, and just really grateful to be here with you today as we contemplate going into what we call Action April around here. And it just coincides this year with Easter weekend and all of that. And yesterday I had an incredible experience. I've told you before numerous times about Dr. Jeffrey Schwartz. Dr. Jeffrey Schwartz, a famous psychiatrist, one of the guys that really unlocked the secrets of how to successfully treat obsessive compulsive disorder without drugs or things like that. Is it helping people use mental force to change their minds? He's one of the guys that figured out what we now call, and everybody talks about on Instagram and everybody talks about all the time on podcasts, and we talk about self-directed neuroplasticity. 20 years ago, that wasn't a thing. Like Nobody really understood that you could use your mind to change your brain. In fact, the, the bulk of psychiatry and psychology for generations, and even still, operates out of this principle of reductionist, materialist, determinism, which means that basically how you are is how your brain is and what your brain does is what you do and that the brain generates the mind and that the only reason we even have a mind or can talk about self or anything like that is because of some evolutionary process where we finally got our brains complex enough that it could generate this epiphenomenon of mind and that you're not even able to really have free will or any independent thought, but everything you do is just a bunch of circuits firing and electrical impulses in your neurons. Well, Jeffrey Schwartz came along and, and people like Andrew Newberg and other people in the late 90s and early 2000s with functional brain imaging, and they said, wait a minute, there, there's more going on here because people can change how they think, and it turns out to rewire and structurally change their brain. And they did all these studies with with meditation and with people with learning new skills and all these brain imaging studies that show cab drivers in England, for example, that after a certain amount of time studying the maps, their hippocampus gets bigger. People who meditate for eight weeks get bigger hippocampi and per parts of their brain involved in resilience and emotional regulation get bigger. And so we, we see that the things you think about and the things you do with your mind change your brain. And so the good news for us here on Cell Brain Surgery Saturday is as we get into Action April, I want you to be aware that what we talk about here on this podcast is literally self-brain surgery. You, you literally can change the structure of your brain by changing what you think about. And I want to remind you that we talk all the time about smashing faith and neuroscience together. The Bible's been telling us for thousands of years, going back to the Old Testament, that when you think differently, your brain behaves differently. The Bible doesn't use words like brain. The Bible uses words like mind and heart and soul and things like that. But what the Bible's talking about is that when you think differently, when you transform your thinking, you will change your life. And that has all kinds of implications, as we've talked about with generational issues and, and how we live our lives and the things we pass on to our children and breaking down traumas and things from the past. All of that stuff is literally in your control if you're willing to learn how to perform self-brain surgery. Today, I want to parse out between self-brain surgery and directed neuroplasticity and cognitive behavioral therapy and all those kinds of things. There's a whole interlap, overlap of all these things that we talk about and what's what. And why does one sound better than the other to me as a Christian who's also a scientist, who's also a surgeon? How, how do I sort of see the difference between what we call self-brain surgery and what the psychologist might call self-directed neuroplasticity or what somebody else might just call therapy or learning how to think differently or self-help or those kinds of things? What's the difference in all those things? And I just want to tell you about four different pathways towards mind change. And we've talked about them before, but I want to give them to you in a new way today. I had some insight this morning as I was doing my Bible study into something Jesus said, and I think it's relevant. And as we wrap up Mind Change March, we're getting into Action April. I just want you to, I want you to go into this month with a confidence that you really can change. That whatever you're dealing with, whatever you've been through, whatever has hurt you, whatever is limiting you, whatever is holding you back, or if you're if you're doing great and you're not bereaved and you're and you're relatively happy and things are going okay, but you just feel like something doesn't quite taste right, you can't quite put your finger on it, but you think that your life is supposed to be a little different 
than the life you're actually living, then self-brain surgery is the path to get there. It's where faith and science really smash together. And it really structurally, literally is like me doing surgery in the operating room, except I don't have to shave your head. I don't have to make an incision in your scalp. I don't have to drill your skull open. And you don't have to recover from that painful operation and walk around with a big scar on your head and take time off work and recover and go to rehab and all that stuff. You don't have to do that because you can do this surgery by changing how you think. And it will literally change your mind and literally change your life. And before we can do any of that today, as we wrap up Mind Change March and get ready for Action April, I have one question for you. Hey, are you ready to change your life? If the answer is yes, there's only one rule. You have to change your mind first. And my friend, there's a place where the neuroscience of how your mind works smashes together with faith and everything starts to make sense. Are you ready to change your life? Well, this is the place, Self Brain Surgery School. I'm Dr. Lee Warren, and this is where we go deep into how we're wired, take control of our thinking, and find real hope. This is where we learn to become healthier, feel better, and be happier. This is where we leave the past behind and transform our minds. This is where we start today. Are you ready? This is your podcast. This is your place. This is your time, my friend. Let's get after it. All right, let's get after it. Hey, I'm so grateful to be with you. And it's it's such an honor to have a chance to talk to you and wherever you are in the world to know that you're out there and you're listening and you're learning and you're trying to apply these principles and you're trying to find a way to change your mind and change your life. And I'm so grateful that I get to be part of that journey with you. Every time I do this, I'm, I'm aware of and honored by the fact that you are giving me a chance to participate and your healing. That's my calling, by the way. I'm a neurosurgeon, but my identity and my calling is not about putting knife on skin. It's about helping people figure out what hurts them and finding a way to heal it and finding a way to get better. And so that that a big part of that and how I actually make my living is in the practice of neurosurgery. But a, a more sort of nuanced approach to that has to do with whether you need physical surgery or not, helping you figure out what hurts and what to do about it is my general calling. So I have a, I have a high degree of gratitude for you letting me part of be letting me be part of whatever it is that you're dealing with in your life. And we love to hear from you. We love these voicemails that we get. Speakpipe.com slash Dr. Lee Warren. You can leave us a voicemail and ask a question. Sometimes I work those into episodes. And if you give me your permission, I'll even play your voice sometimes on the podcast and, and play that so other people can hear a real person who's dealing with something. Or if you want to leave a prayer request, you can go to the prayer wall, wleewarnmd.com slash prayer, and people will pray for you. You'll get an email every time somebody around the world prays for you. And that's a great thing. The newsletter on Sunday, every week, the self brain surgery newsletter, drleewarn.substack.com. That's a way you can hear from me in writing every week. And you can leave comments and we can have conversations on Substack about that. Or you can always send an email, lee at drleewarn.com. And we will try really hard to reply to all of those. But this is a community, okay? We're, we're together in this. And Lisa and I see it as a way of honoring our son, Mitch. And, and we lost him uh, almost 11 years ago now. And, and we feel that this work that we're doing is a way to honor him and keep his legacy more than being about his loss, but actually about his life and how his life motivated us to try to help other people and all that stuff. So we're just super grateful. And today, as we wrap up Mind Change March, it's almost Easter. So today's that Saturday between Good Friday when Jesus died on the cross and between Sunday when he rose from the ground, rose from the grave, that there was a day when everything seemed lost. There was a day when all these people who had pinned their hopes on him as their savior, and they thought he was going to rescue them from Roman occupation and rescue them from oppressive religiosity and that he was going to be the Messiah and the way they saw it, that was going to be an earthly kingdom. And now he was dead so that they were lost. Now they spent this 24-hour period in misery and, and worry and fear and not knowing what was really going to happen. But in the perspective that comes with time, we can look back and see that that awful Friday and that silent Saturday were leading up to that resurrection Sunday and that hope arose 
but it was never really gone. It was just working its way back into the picture on that silent Saturday. Yesterday, Jeffrey Schwartz called me. Dr. Jeffrey Schwartz, we had a long conversation on the phone, and he shared with me the work of T.S. Eliot, who was a poet in the last century, early part of the 20th century. And T.S. Eliot, he said, really had a lot to do with him becoming a Christian. So Jeffrey Schwartz was a secular Jew who then kind of got sort of into Buddhism. He never became a Buddhist, but he recognized the importance of meditation and learning to calm your mind and all those things. And he ultimately found his way to Christ by searching out the works of Kierkegaard and Eliot and others, and through brain science kind of brought himself to a a saving relationship with the Lord. Well, Jeffrey Schwartz called me as we were talking about a potential collaboration that we might do. He read me from T.S. Eliot's poem, and I want to just read you a short section of this. This is one of the four quartets, part four, for Good Friday, and he says this, The wounded surgeon plies the steel that questions the distempered part. Beneath the bleeding hands, we feel the sharp compassion of the healer's art, resolving the enigma of the fever chart. Our only health is the disease. If we obey the dying nurse whose constant care is not to please, but to remind of our and Adam's curse, and that to be restored, our sickness must grow worse. The whole earth is our hospital, endowed by the ruined millionaire, wherein, if we do well, We shall die of the absolute paternal care that will not leave us, but prevents us everywhere. The chill ascends from feet to knees. The fever sings in mental wires. If to be warmed, then I must freeze and quake in frigid purgatorial fires of which the flame is roses and the smoke is briars. The dripping blood our only drink, the bloody flesh our only food in spite of which we like to think that we are sound, substantial flesh and blood. Again, in spite of that, we call this Friday good. Eliot's saying all the hard things we must go through if we really want to live, and all the difficulties and all the pain, all that stuff is part of the process. And especially when we look at Jesus, Jesus had to suffer and die on the cross and be buried before he could rise again to put death in the ground for good. And I just thought it was amazing that Jeffrey shared that with me. And it puts kind of into context the the scale and the scope of the work that we're doing here, friend. When you're deciding that you're willing to go through this self-brain surgery process, there's some decisions that have to be made. And there's some things you have to let go of if you're really going to make progress. There's some things that need to stay in the ground. You know, when Jesus came up and they walked into the tomb, when Peter and John walked into the tomb, the, the grave clothes were left behind. There there were some things that went into the tomb with him that did not come out. He rose, but he left some things behind. And I just want you to know that when you make a decision to let him resurrect you into this new mind and new life that you can have and he desires for you to have, and I can teach you the the structural elements of how you can do that, but there's some stuff you're going to have to leave behind. And so today on that silent Saturday, maybe one of the things that you could do in addition to worshiping and being in awe of him and and the great thing that he's done, is put yourself in that position of thinking through that if Jesus was going to resurrect you and you were going to have a new mind and a new life, what things would you need to leave behind? What things should stay behind and not come out of that grave with you? What things should you not drag into this new life you could leave behind in that old life that that he made possible for you to leave behind because you now have the mind of Christ. You now have a renewed mind. You now have the ability to change the way you think and change the way you live and structurally change your brain. So what needs to stay behind? Now, that being said, that's kind of a long prelude to this idea that when we talk about Action April, it's time to stop contemplating all these changes we want to make and it's time to start operating. So it's time for you to pick up the knife and get after the business of really becoming a self-brain surgeon. For the last eight weeks, a number of us have been doing this abide practice where we've been working on practicing, incorporating some time in quiet, contemplative meditation and prayer into our daily quiet time routine. And I hope that that's been helpful to you. I hope that if you've been doing that, that you've noticed some changes. And if you haven't been sort of able to work through and think about the different ways that your brain might have improved and your mind might have improved over the last eight weeks. Let me just give you a few 
thoughts and maybe you can run a list for yourself and see if it has been helping. And if you haven't been doing it, I would just recommend download the Lectio 365 app. That's a an app that was produced by Pete Gregg of the 24-7 Prayer Movement, one of my favorite writers. I've read three of his books, God on Mute, How to Hear God, and How to Pray. And those are tremendous books. And Pete's going to be on the podcast in April. So I can't wait for you to meet him. But he has an app that's free on the App Store, wherever you get your apps, called Lectio, L-E-C-T-I-O, 365. And there's a morning and evening devotional. And both of them get you into this kind of meditative, quiet space with some music and some scripture and some prayer time. And, and it would be a great way for you to take this abide practice and go forward. And I'll put the abide lingo, the, the words that I use to kind of think about in the show notes today and a link to that app if you want to continue using it this is there's no money trans no money changes hands here it's a free app you don't have to sign up for anything you don't have to put your email in it just it's an app that pete and his team have created that is incredibly powerful lisa's been using it all year and i just started using it in the last little bit and it's important but so if you've been doing the abide practice and you're not sure if it's been helping let me just work you through some things that have probably happened in your brain So based on neuroscience and brain imaging, we know that if you meditate for as little as 10 minutes a day for as short as eight weeks, you should have seen, if we did brain imaging on you before and after, we should see a 22 or so percent increase in the volume of the parts of your brain that are responsible for emotional regulation. We should see enhanced brain response time, better memory, increased cognitive powers, and increased behavioral abilities. We should see a brain that's more relaxed and more energy efficient. And we should see that you don't need numbing behaviors, drugs, surgeries, supplements, or other things as much as you thought you did because now you're more mindful and you're more able to tap into the healing power that's already in your brain. And so maybe you would have noticed that you're less triggered by things that happen in your life, that people aren't setting you off quite as easily, that that your spouse or your friends or your kids aren't annoying you quite as much as they did before. Maybe you're not quite as startled by sudden noises or things that happen that jump into your vision. Maybe you're not quite as bothered by the way your kids behave. Maybe you're more able to converse with them and less emotional or or disruptive with them. Maybe you're not quite as worried about politics. Maybe you're less annoyed when you're stuck behind that car in traffic or the tractor if you live in Nebraska. Maybe the news isn't bothering you quite as much, or maybe you don't feel yourself quite so drawn to social media and you're spending more time thinking and praying than you are scrolling and swiping. Maybe you're less concerned about your body and the way it looks. Maybe you're more connected to the way your creator sees you and, and you're less worried about winning or losing. You're maybe not quite so stressed out about investments or finances. Maybe you're more calm when people around you are more stressed out. Maybe you don't feel quite as overwhelmed. Maybe you're not so worried, but you have more of a strategic idea of how you're going to handle your life. Maybe you're not as worried about your age or how your body's changing over time. Maybe some of the things that used to stress you out aren't quite stressing you out as much. So those are the kinds of things that happen when your brain gets structurally better, my friend. And if you've been meditating and praying through this abide process for eight weeks, you've made some of those changes already. So just take a minute today, maybe, and just work through a list of what's different for me than it was eight weeks ago. Maybe run that SOAP method, that medical student note-taking process that I told you about where we have this process called the SOAP note. And the first thing we have is the, the chief complaint where we have to say, what is the patient here for to be seen today? And you write down the, just the very essential reason for the visit. The patient is anxious. The patient has back pain. The patient has a headache. So do that for yourself. What's my chief complaint? Eight weeks ago, I was stressed about money. Eight weeks ago, I was overwhelmed with grief. So that was my chief complaint. Well, let's have a subjective, objective assessment and plan. Let's run through the soap note and compare what happened then with what's happening now. And if you haven't done this, then start today and just write a chief complaint and a soap note about how you're feeling today. And then start this meditation process. Use Pete's app and do it for eight weeks and then write that note all along each day and compare the start to the finish. And subjective means the things that you feel. So the the things a patient says to me, I feel like my leg is going to fall off. I feel like my head's going to explode. I feel like I'm in a vice grip. Those are subjective things, what you feel. 
objective. So the O in SOAP is the things that you can test and measure. Well, I put you in a scanner and your head's not actually about to explode, or I'm looking at your leg and examining it and it's not falling off of your body. And so the objective things, here's your blood pressure. Here's what the labs say. Here's what the scan says. Here's the biopsy result. These are objective things that independent observers could agree on that are true. So feelings aren't facts. Subjective things are not always true. And objective things are true and can be measured, can be observed by independent observers so that we don't have to wonder if they're real or not. We can know that they're true and know that they're real. And then assessment is what are we going to do? Or I'm sorry, where do we find ourselves here? We've we've compared the complaint to the subjective and objective things. And here's where we are. So the assessment would be something like 47-year-old man who is an alcoholic who is concerned about his future and might lose his job. That's the assessment. We, we, we've come to the place, a 37-year-old lady whose husband just died of glioblastoma and she feels like she's stuck in grief. What's the plan? So the plan is, here's what we're going to do about it, okay? Here's where I find myself, here's how I feel, and here's how that compares to the things I can measure and test, and here's the assessment of where I actually am. So it started with a complaint, and now it's down to an assessment an objective assessment, and now we have to make a plan. It's time to stop contemplating, and it's time to start operating. Okay, so that's assessment and plan. We're going to get after it. So this is Action April, and it's time to get after it. So I just wanted you to, to work through that abide process one more time and have an understanding of where we are and what we actually need to do about it. So there's, there's four things. There's, there's four paths of how you can move through the idea of having self-brain surgery or self-directed neuroplasticity or whatever you want to call it. And the four paths are, there's there's something that I call the imperceptible happening. And that's this fact. And this is the reason primarily why I I prefer to call it self-brain surgery as opposed to self-directed neuroplasticity. And that is, if we say self-directed neuroplasticity, that implies that that process is only happening if you direct it yourself. But the truth is that process is happening passively every second of every day, whether you do it willfully or not. Your brain is being shaped, whether you shape it purposefully or you allow it to happen passively. And it's most things, when you let passive processes happen, the default situation generally leads to downgrade. And if you don't believe that, plant a garden and then don't tend it for three or four weeks and see if things get better out there or if they get worse. You're going to go out there and you're going to find the birds have eaten everything up and the and the weeds have choked everything out. And it doesn't get better unless it's tended and stewarded by a careful and diligent gardener, right? Because default and passive usually lead to things getting worse over time instead of better. So you've got this imperceptible happening. This neural pathway rewiring is happening all the time in your brain, whether you do something about it or not, whether you intentionally steward it or not, it's happening. It's imperceptible. It's happening all the time. The microtubules in your brain have rewired millions of neurons and synapses since we started listening to this podcast. Okay, your brain is not the same as it was 30 minutes ago, and it's not the same as it will be 30 minutes from now, even though you haven't been intentionally changing. Okay, it's imperceptible happening. That's the base level. And if you don't decide to be in charge of that process, you might not like the result because it's going to feel the same or worse than it's already felt. And if you were happy with how things were going, you probably wouldn't be listening to a podcast about changing your mind and changing your life. So what got you here to this place won't get you into Action April in a different place unless you decide to change it by becoming a self-brain surgeon and implementing these things and doing them aggressively and actively, okay? So what I don't want for you is I don't want you to feel like your life is in the middle of a long series of dominoes that are falling and you're just waiting until the domino next to you knocks you over and you're not in charge. I want you to feel like you're the first domino. You're the first one. You're deciding how this change is going to happen. You're going to say, hey, this is when this thing is going to go down, and this is how it's going to go down, okay? Now, don't confuse that to say that you can control all the circumstances. You can't, but you can control your responses to those circumstances, and that's what the self-brain surgery idea is about. So besides the imperceptible happening, there's this idea that I call the immediate hack. I mean, you can be the guy or the lady who just wants to know the quick fix, the hack, the baseline thing, the quick thing that you can do, the control alt delete that you can do to learn a little way to manipulate the system so that you can control it a little bit. And that's this 10% happier idea, this idea that 
we can just learn a few little mental tricks and hacks and self-help ideas and we can basically get a little happier and, and that'll be a decent way to live our life. You don't require, that doesn't require any spiritual element, doesn't require any faith, doesn't require much work. It's just this little pause between stimulus and response that'll help you be a little happier and it does work. But why does it work if you don't imply, if you don't impart any faith or spiritual elements? Why does that work? Somebody wrote in not long ago and said, you know, I don't think you can really change your mind or change your life without God. And that's just not true. It's not reasonable to say that because God gave us this general grace. Second Corinthians says he provides seed for the sower and bread for the eater. God gives us processes and systems and tools that work, even if you don't believe him. Jesus said the Lord causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. The sun shines on the good and the wicked. So the fact is you can change your mind without any input from any additional help by calling on him, just by the process that he's created and put into place, you can have this immediate sort of hack and make things a little better. Or you can even get deeper. You can open the hood up and learn all about the neuroscience and learn all about how your brain works and how things really really happen neurologically. And you can learn all about neurotransmitters and all about how your mind and your brain interact. And that's, you know, Dawson Church and Andrew Newberg and all these guys that have figured all these brain science things out. And you can really get deep into it. And that's what I call the immersive help. Like you can help yourself and change your mind a lot by getting deep into the neuroscience. Okay. You really can. But that, in my opinion, it's kind of like having a computer with a with a hard drive and a USB slot so you can stick new software in there and you can change it and you can make it better but it's not quite as powerful as it would be if you connected it to the internet. And so the final step, the final path, the fourth one is what I call the infinite healing. This is how you connect your mind to your spirit so that the great physician who created you can influence and command and control and help you take the the reins and change this thing under his direction so that you can actually manage your mind and your brain the way it was designed to be operated. And that's how you're going to reach the highest level of hope and healing in your life. And just this morning, we've talked about all that stuff before, but just this morning dawned on me that the parable of the sower in the gospel of Mark actually kind of describes these four processes. And I never never put this one together before, but in the gospel of Mark, we have this story that Jesus tells of how the farmer goes out and throws seed. And some of it lands on this ground that's not very good. It just lands on the ground on the path that's been hard packed and the birds really quickly come and eat it up, okay? So basically, if you have this notion that pops into your head that you'd like to change your mind, but you don't do anything about it, then that that notion that you have, that, that possibility is going to fall on some hard packed ground and pretty quickly your brain's going to rewire and go right back to the way it's always been. And you're not going to make any change and you're going to start to feel like things are stuck because you didn't give your brain a chance to till the soil up and really make that stuff get down and deep and grow. It just fell on the hard path pack. And then Jesus said, there's a second guy that comes and throws the seed out in, and it lands in this rocky place where the soil's really shallow and it tries to grow, but it can't go very far. And as soon as the sun comes up, it just cooks it up and burns it up. And I think that's what happens with the immediate hack folks. That it's, it's fine if the problem's not very big. It's fine if you're just a little bit kind of anxious or something. It works pretty well. But if you have a real problem, if some massive thing happens in your life, that 10% happier is going to burn up in the sun. It's not going to be enough. That toolkit is not deep enough to really make a difference for you. And it's not going to help for very long. In the third group, the seed falls among thorns. And they, they grow down and they start to grow and it grows up and, and all of a sudden the thorns and the weeds grow up and kind of choke everything out and it's not able to bear grain. So it, it grows and it gets going and it, it lasts a little longer and it has a little more power to it, but it doesn't really make it in the end. And I think that's where private sort of this sort of self-directed process where you take this idea that you can take the reins and take charge and, and you can work through things on your own. I think that's, that's kind of this third level. You can make progress and you can do some good things for yourself and you'll see some growth and you'll see some change. But I think there's going to be a level where you feel like it's not enough. Like that something's going to happen in your life where you feel like you, you just don't quite have the juice or the power that you need. And there's going to be something, some level 
that you feel like you're missing something. It doesn't quite taste right. The fourth level, the seed falls on good soil. It grows up and produces a crop and it's 30 or 60 or 100 times better. That, in my opinion, is the infinitely happier level where we let the Lord, the great physician, the healer, come and be part of the process and put those roots down and really learn how to make these changes and decide what stays in the ground and what comes up out with us when the resurrection, the new life, the transformation happens. Does that make sense? I hope so. Listen, it's action April almost in a couple of days, and we're just finishing up Mind Change March, and it's time to make some decisions about what we're going to leave in the ground and what we're going to allow to come into life. And we're going to see some real powerful change. We're going to see some real structural changes in our brain. We're going to see some real things that we can take notice of. We can subjectively and objectively make assessments about, and we'll make a plan to stop contemplating and start operating. And we're going to see some action happening in Action April. And we're going to start today. Hey, thanks for listening. The Dr. Lee Warren podcast is brought to you by my brand new book, Hope is the First Dose. It's a treatment plan for recovering from trauma, tragedy, and other massive things. It's available everywhere books are sold, and I narrated the audio books. Hey, the theme music for the show is Get Up by my friend Tommy Walker, available for free at TommyWalkerMinistries.org. They are supplying worship resources for worshipers all over the world to worship the Most High God. And if you're interested in learning Learning more, check out TommyWalkerMinistries.org. If you need prayer, go to the prayer wall at WLeeWarrenMD.com slash prayer, WLeeWarrenMD.com slash prayer, and go to my website and sign up for the newsletter, Self Brain Surgery, every Sunday since 2014, helping people in all 50 states and 60 plus countries around the world. I'm Dr. Lee Warren, and I'll talk to you soon. Remember, friend, you can't change your life until you change your mind. And the good news is you can start today.